Yes, I, uh, I have to talk to you for this lecture about praxeology, but before uh, starting my lecture, I'd like to note uh, one feature of my lecture. You'll no doubt have noticed this already, that I don't have PowerPoints for my lecture. And I'd like to explain why I don't use them. In the years I've used PowerPoints, I've invariably gotten them mixed up, shifting from one PowerPoint to another, and someone has had, I've had to stop the lecture, someone has had to come in and rescue me, one of the technical people. This has sometimes happened more than once in the same lecture. So I thought to myself, well, I'll get out of that. I just won't use any PowerPoints. Then I won't have the problem of someone having to rescue me. But it didn't work because what I'm seeing now in front of me is the last PowerPoint that Jeff Herbener had in his lecture on market clearing price. So that's going to get me mixed up. Now I could try to solve that by just stepping away, lecturing over here, but then I'd be away from the mic and you wouldn't be able to hear me at all. So I'm told, so you see the lecture is a failure before it's even begun. <laughs> and, I, and I can assure you, you won't have reason to change your opinion during the lecture. Now, uh, praxeology is, the word praxeology uh, can be used in two different ways. One is for a, a science of human action as developed by Ludwig von Mises and his successors, principally Murray Rothbard. And the other is for the distinctive method, the deductive method used in, in, praxia, in the science of human action. So it has these two uses. Uh, and people sometimes say, why should I study praxeology? What's, what can I do with praxeology? And I like to tell people, well, if you've taken this course and other courses, then you can always open a praxeology shop. <laughs> so you will have something to do with it. I should say also, uh, this lecture is, uh, largely dealing with philosophy. And when I give uh, philosophy lectures, I like to give the comment of my old friend and uh, Father James Sadowski, who taught at Fordham University in the philosophy department. And he said, the word philosophy is derived from the Greek word philosophia, which means philosophy. <laughs> uh, now, uh, in when there's something quite remarkable about having economics, uh, as Mises does in human action, to consider, e to consider economics as part of a more general science of human action. And we want to raise the question, why did Mises do that? Uh, j before Mises wrote, uh, economics had been generally uh, characterized as the uh, a science of wealth. And the question is, why is it 
did Mises want to make it a part of this more general science of human action? And the reason for this is that he thought that there was a distinctive kind of knowledge that we have of all human action and that we can uh, know certain things about human action just by thinking about these things. We would have certain, what he called, a priori knowledge of or knowledge, a priori of these things, of knowledge based just on thinking about these things. And uh, before I get into why, what the rationale for his thinking that, we first have to understand the concept of action. The, uh, Dr. Herbener uh, mentioned this in his previous lecture, and action is the use of mean use of means to attain an end. If I have, I would have certain. I have a certain goal or end, and I think this can be attained by using certain means, for example, uh, say, uh, I want to learn something about praxeology, that's your end, so you have the means is to come to this lecture. That would possibly uh, be an example of human, human action. We, can, we have all sorts of thing, and things that we do are human actions. Uh, they're primarily involve physical motions, doing things. But we can also have thinking can be an action. There is a logician in the British logician and philosopher, uh, Lucy Stebbing, who had a book called Thinking to Some Purpose. So here, you could be thinking about a problem, and thinking is your means to uh, get to the goal of solving the problem. Uh, as I say, action usually involves all physical motions of the body. We can think of exceptions to this where you can act not just by thinking, but you can act just by, uh, you, you can act without, you can do something without moving your body. An example which the late uh, great British philosopher Elizabeth Anscombe would give, uh, supposing uh, we're at a meeting and the chairman of the meeting says, everybody who, who uh, accepts my proposal signify, everyone who agrees with me signify by remaining seated. So you all remain seated, so you've all agreed with me. Uh, what, uh, in past years when I've given this example, uh, Peter Klein tried to ruin things for me by standing up at this point. Uh, he's the sort of person who does things <laughs> like that, but he has other redeeming qualities, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm not, I'm having, I, won't, uh, I won't try to enumerate them because <laughs> I don't think none is coming to mind. Uh, all right, so that's uh, what we mean by action. Now, I should, uh, we should take account, it seems very obvious that there are actions in uh, the sense I've just described, 
but there are there are people who deny this. There are people, there are philosophers who say, uh, no, people don't act. Uh, uh, now we would have the question, uh, can you think of how someone, it seems very obvious that uh, people act, but how would someone deny that, uh, one way would be to say uh, people move their bodies in certain ways. They have their certain physical behavior that they engage in, but this physical behavior is determined by a certain outside stimuli, stimuli. So say just like uh, we can imagine, say, uh, dogs respond to uh, 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 to food by salivating. People will respond by saying or doing things in response when they are given various uh, physical events, but these it isn't that in this in that view, which is called behaviorism, it isn't that the people are consciously thinking I'm going to do that I want this, therefore, I'm going to use this means to it to do that. They may be thinking they may be thinking that or not, but that isn't what's determining their behavior. Uh, they're just uh, res they're just responding to uh, to what's going on in the outside. And there's a variation on this which the. Uh, Harvard psychologist B.F. Skinner developed called operant conditioning, where what they're responding to is the expectation of some future event. But again, it isn't going through any kind of process of thought on their their part. Uh, It, it seems like that, that seems a very implausible view of things. And one, uh, one way that's often been used to try to show that that's not a plausible way of taking things, uh, viewing uh, human action, is to say, uh, well, Suppose someone says we're not influenced by purpose or goals in uh, in what we do. So then, the person who says that, the person who says I deny that we're uh, influenced by person or uh, uh, goals in determining what we do is himself acting, so he's contradicting himself by saying that, so he's showing that there are actions just by saying that. As I say, that's very often given as an argument that this behaviorist position is impossible, but I must say, although it's a minority view uh, among the uh, lecturers here. I'm not, I don't really see the force of that argument because uh, what would, if the behaviorist is right, then the person wouldn't be uh, the person who says that wouldn't be saying that because he has some goal or purpose. 
but what's supposed to be the contradiction in that? I'm not seeing what it is. Uh, possibly a better argument would be to say, well, we're, if the behavior, which I think is a much better argument is, if the behavior is, says uh, he believes, he thinks behaviorism is true because uh, he would have certain reasons for this and those, re and he would think there are arguments in favor of uh, accepting behaviorism, but presumably if he thinks there are arguments in favor of behaviorism, then he thinks that people could be, uh, could, it, if, if he says, well, should people accept those arguments, then he would seem to be, he would seem to have to say on his own theory, people, whether people would accept those is just a matter of how they respond to the stimulus of hearing the arguments. He wouldn't be able to really fit in that there are reasons for accepting behavior and that that does seem implausible. But as I said, as I said, or at least I think I said this, the main reason we should accept that there are actions is that it's obvious that there are such actions. We act all the time. We, we do so in throughout our lives. It isn't really open to serious doubt that we act. Uh, now, this raises another point, and this is one that I think is very important in understanding what Mises is doing in praxeology, in talking about praxeology. Uh, we could imagine saying, well, you think it's obvious that it seems to us that we're acting, we're doing all sorts of things. But what if we're just dreaming? What if we're uh, not acting at all, but we're just asleep and dreaming? Or what if we're just brains in a vat who are being manipulated by uh, neuroscientists to have certain experiences namely the experiences we have of acting in our daily lives, then in fact, we're not acting, we're just having the skeptical, we just think we're acting, but we're in fact not. And it's important here to realize that, and this people don't believe me, but, uh, Praxeology is intended by Mises as one of the sciences. It's not a physical science, it's a social science. It's not a branch of philosophy. So Mises is not concerned with solving the problem of how we know there's an external world. How do we know that? the world exists apart from our consciousness. That's a problem addressed in philosophy, but not in praxeology. As an example, uh, supposing, as you'll be hearing later on in your lectures, uh, supposing we have in the Austrian, in Austrian economics, there is a, an uh, explanation of the business cycle in terms of the uh, generation of bank credit, which uh, lowers the 
interest rates artificially. And suppose we imagine people asking, is this a good explanation of the business cycle? It wouldn't be a very good response to that to say, well, hold on a minute. How can we talk about business cycles? We haven't even proved there's an external world at all yet. <laughs> so you see, this is not some, it, as I say, in, in, the, in the sciences, we take as given the uh, existence of the physical world. A related point to this is sometimes people will raise this, they'll say, well, uh, I know that I'm acting, uh, I have uh, ends and purposes, and I use means to attain these ends or purposes, but how do I know that any of you have uh, ends or purposes? I can't see into your minds. For all I know, you could be all robots. You might not have minds at all. You could just be going through different physical motions. How do I know? I, I know that I have ends or goals, but how do I know any of you do? And point quite analogous to uh, what I've said about external world skepticism applies here also, which is that uh, praxeology isn't an attempt to solve the problem of other minds. Uh, in praxeology, just as in the science, in the physical sciences, we just take for granted that other people exist and other people have minds. It isn't something that we is, has to be established philosophically. Uh, one of, uh, when I got my degree it, many decades ago at UCLA, one of the people on my PhD committee was a philosopher uh, called Robert Yost. And uh, if he was asked, do you believe in other minds? And he said, uh, he would always say very few of them. <laughs> uh, so now that we have an idea of what human action is and how we know uh, there are human actions, we can now turn to this special kind of knowledge, which is called a priori knowledge, knowledge that we can get just by thinking about it. Uh, now, one point, of, uh, for example, uh, means to, uh, is it, one example of a claim Mises thought was a priori true was one uh, been mentioned, I think, by both uh, Joe Salerno and Jeff Herbiner. Uh, we rank our preferences in order and we choose our highest valued preference. So, uh, Supposing, say, you chose to come to this lecture, your ranking coming to this lecture higher than your uh, choice of doing something else. I'm sure almost all of you are regretting having had that preference. It would have been much, you would have been happier had you not come to the lecture. And if you, that's how you feel, I, I heartily agree with you. 
Uh, but so Mises said we can just by thinking about this realize that this is true. Uh, an objection you might give at this point is uh, this couldn't be right because it, supposing uh, people, there were no, there was no such thing as choice and preference. Supposing the uh, behaviors were right and people just acted in purely in response to physical stimuli. There wouldn't be any preferences at all. So don't we have to have some reference to experience before we can talk about uh, our knowledge about preferences? How can we say that you always choose your most highest value preference if we don't we have to show that there are preferences in the first place and this objection is based on a misunderstanding because when we say that something is a priori true it isn't that what we're talking about has no reference to experience. It's just that we can know it's true without testing it, without we, we don't once we, we know there are preferences, we, we're, we're aware of these in the we're aware of these, then by thinking about this, we don't, we realize we choose our highest value preference. We don't have to keep going through various choices. And we may say, did I pick my highest value preference in this case? Did I do it in the next case? And so on, just as say, if we know a priori that two plus two equals four, we don't have to keep testing this. We don't have to uh, get two objects, put them together with another two objects. Say, well, we have two objects here, two objects there, and then see, did it add up to four? in this case, and then do it for another two objects and keep doing that uh, until we thought we had enough tests to say this was a reasonable hypothesis that two plus two equals four. No, we just uh, think, ab think about it and see that two plus two equals Four, uh, there are people. There are people who philosophers who deny that there is such a thing as a priori knowledge in the sense I've just explained, and one uh, group who. Uh, who really, I shouldn't say denied a priori knowledge altogether, but they thought it was insignificant. It really didn't amount to anything. Uh, was the logical positivists who are so-called Vienna circle who was very prominent in Vienna in the 1920s or 1930s. And in their view, an a priori judgment is just a logical triviality. It's just something that's true by definition. 
or something that is doesn't tell you anything. Uh, just as uh, suppose we say, someone says, uh, "How's how's the weather uh, today?" and someone else answers, "It's either raining or it isn't raining." That's true, but it isn't telling you anything. It's just uh, the application of a logical principle. So it isn't really telling you anything. So uh, these logical positivists would say uh, a priori knowledge in economics that Mises is claiming praxeology is like that, that say if if Mises says you always choose your highest value preference, he's just defining highest value preference as what you actually choose. So he isn't telling you anything significant. He's just saying, uh, I'm going to call whatever you choose in a given situation your highest value choice, but uh, this isn't the case at all. Mises isn't defining the two terms in the same way. Mises is saying, if we think about it, we can, we can, we have the concept of a preference and we also know what a choice is. And just by thinking about it, we can see we will choose our highest valued preference. Uh, so it's not, as the positivist said, a tautology. Uh, now in the time left, uh, I want to talk about why, oh, I should say before getting on to this next topic, I should say the Vienna circle illustrates the dangers of being a philosopher, uh, the circle was headed by a, a, the philosopher Moritz Schlick, and uh, one of his students who had gotten his PhD with Schlick uh, became very dissatisfied with Schlick. It's uh, un there are different accounts of what he was dissatisfied about, but uh, one day he saw Schlick at, uh, going to his uh, going up the stairs at the University of Vienna, and uh, this man who did it, his last name was Nelbach, uh, uh, showed his dis dissatisfaction with Schlick by just coming up and shooting him dead. So I, I always think this is, I hope people aren't that dissatisfied with my lectures that they do that. Uh, I, during the, uh, the man was arrested, uh, this, this happened I think around in the, around 19, 19 uh, in the 19th, late 1930s, but after the, uh, the Nazis uh, took over Austria in the so-called Anschluss, I think he was eventually let go. And he, uh, so he, and he lived, he lived after the war. So he did better, the, the, the dissatisfied student did better than the professor. But uh, to get to the why we, Mises thought it was important that we have this a priori knowledge that he thought that if we have such, a priori, if it's a priori true that human beings act, we can derive, we can, by thinking about human action, we can derive uh, certain laws about human action, such as the one we always 
choose our most highly valued preference or if the, uh, if the price of a good goes up, other things being equal, the quantity demanded will go down. We could know these are true just by thinking about them. Uh, say in the law of demand, we could, if we realize we have their alternatives, we want different things with their different goods and services we want. And if the price of a, one of these goods goes up, then we have, we'll have less to spend on other things that we want. So just by realizing that and thinking about that, we can see that the law of demand is true. It isn't the sort of law that has to be established by testing. Uh, in neoclassical economics, they would take a different view. They would also have deduction where they would set up models. And, but then they'd say, we don't know whether, we can't just tell from the model whether what the conclusions of the model are true. These have to be tested. And this isn't the way it's done in Austrian economics. And one further difference is that when Mises talks about uh, uh, logic, the deduction, he's concerned with logic in the or in our ordinary language sense where we're, we're reasoning in words. He isn't thinking, talking about symbolic or mathematical logic because in, if we have, we're in the type of logic reasoning he's engaged in, we're thinking about eat, what the significance of what we're doing each step of the way. Uh, if we were using symbolic logic, we'd have to translate the symbols into words at each step. But it's in praxeology, it's important that we use the, we understand what's going on at each step. And Mises is rejecting the view that some people have. Some people will say, well, there are different sorts of logic, say, uh, there are logics that deny the law of non-contradiction or logics that deny law of excluded middle or there are groups of people who don't use the logic we do. They have their own logic. Mises is, is taking, is saying no, there's only one logic we could set up if we wanted various, for various purposes, certain technical logics in which uh, people make other assumptions, but these would have to be understood in terms of the ordinary language he's talking about. So, by logic, he just means ordinary logic. Uh, now, why is it important we have this notion of logic? And the reason this is important is that if we start off from a true premise and we deduce 
conclusions correctly from that premise, then it's guaranteed that the results we come up with will be true. So if we have a, a true starting point and we uh, deduce correctly from it, then we're sure that what we get are correct results. Uh, now, suppose we don't have a start with a true premise. Say, uh, uh, we start off with, say, human beings don't act, and we deduce various uh, propositions from that. Uh, would it be the case that what we conclude is guaranteed to be false. Uh, would, what would people say about that? Does anyone have a, have a response? Suppose we start off with false premise, human beings don't act. We deduce various things from it. Is it guaranteed that the conclusion will be false? And uh, that's right. Could you, someone, give an example? Uh, yes. Milton Friedman, in his um, Chicago mo his, uh, models of the free market, always reaching some sort of stable equilibrium, so therefore all the business cycles are caused by inflationary pressures. Uh, yes, that, that would be an example where someone starts off with a wrong premise and comes up with a, a correct conclusion. One might say, uh, probably start off with an example like human beings uh, don't act. So we can deduce from that uh, uh, either human beings don't act or the law of marginal utility is true. We can do that because from every proposition, it, it follows a disjunction of that proposition and some other proposition. We would have, uh, uh, if we start with a proposition that, and we combine it, uh, join it to some true proposition, so then the disjunction is true. So since the law of marginal utility is true, then we've started with a false premise and arrived at the true conclusion. So as I say, the important thing is if we, though, if we start off with true premises, then we're guaranteed that if we reason correctly, the conclusions will be, be true. And I think a lot of people who are interested in praxeology spend a great deal of time thinking about what is the exact nature of our initial premise. Is it a priori? analytic or synthetic, I haven't gone into those, those terms, or what is the basis for a priori knowledge. But the important thing, and more important than that, those are very interesting controversies. What's more important, I think, in praxeology is that we start with this fundamental realization that if we start with a true premise and we reason correctly from it, then it's guaranteed that what we come up with will be true. So I think uh, starting with the true premise that I'm finished my lecture, I'm concluding that it's time for lunch. Uh, thank you. <laughs>